I thought, you know, I want amazing people telling incredible stories. Um, who are some amazing ladies I know? Leia was uh, first on the list. Um, I met Leia. Yes. Two years ago. Yes. Yeah, so I, I went on a road trip all over the country. I was living in my van. Um, L.A. had defeated me at first, and I gave up. And I was, drove up the coast to San Francisco to RubyConf. And my van broke down in the hotel parking lot. Um, it was pretty dire straits there for a few minutes. And um, I was doing the ho uh, the hallway track, and I met Leia, and you know, a ton of mutual friends and. Um, you know, she's been in my life the past couple of few years, and she's a totally rad lady, and she organizes uh, a few conferences a little bit bigger than this one, um, a little bit more professional than this one, and uh, she's going to talk about that a little bit. Leia Silver. Thank you. Woo! Woo! So, I was really excited sort of when Jane asked me to do this, but I was also really, really nervous. Um, I've done a little bit of public speaking, but probably not in like... 10 years. Um, I right. went to I went to a school where like once you got to the second grade they like pushed you in front of like 40 or 50 people um, every couple of weeks and you have to give like a 15 minute to a half an hour long talk and it kind of graduated as you um, as you got older to when you were like in the 10th grade you were probably talking to like eight or 900 people um, a couple of times a year um, and it was it was pretty good and I didn't suck at it I, I kind of thought I was pretty good at it back then but um, it's been a while, so we'll see how it goes. Um, I'm also in one of the like busiest times of my life right now. I'm at a new startup. It's my second startup where I've been here kind of since really, really early on. Um, and we're right in that phase, I'm sure you know, if you've been at a startup where you're literally working like 20 hours a day and you're going to sleep for three and then you wake up again and just jump right back in. Um, and I've got like a major release coming up, so we're right there. I haven't slept in a couple of weeks. Um, I woke up like four days ago and I was like, hmm, that thing that I wanted to prepare really well for. Um, we'll see how that goes. Uh, but one of the reasons I'm nervous is because um, what I do is I build communities and one of the, I build developer communities specifically. And one of the key um, characteristics of a developer community for me is that it's really a meritocracy. It's not just a group of people who kind of get together and care about the same things. It, it is that, but it's really um, one of the shining examples for me of a place where you can kind of come in, be nobody, and really um, become somebody just on the basis of doing awesome things. Um, so I want to be awesome. Um, because like I feel kind of like, to some extent, I feel like a poser when I come to all these events because I'm not a programmer. Um, and sometimes I try, and people seem to really appreciate it. Like, uh, I was sitting on the floor in, at RubyConf in, like, I don't know, many years ago. Um, and I'm sitting with uh, Stephen Bristol from Less Everything and a bunch of other people, and they were like, we're going to teach you how to program. And I took out the, like, Chris Pine Learn to Program book, which I have never gone through but have recommended to, like, a million people. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> Because like, I was sitting on the floor there, and one of the guys next to me was like, well, last year I was working at that animal of some sort. <laughs> um, so this guy sitting next to me was like, well, last year I was working at a retail job at The Gap, and then I read this book, and now I'm making six figures, and I'm a programmer, and it's awesome, and you can do it. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. Um, and I sat there, and I read it, and I got up to the um, chapter on flow control, which made everybody laugh and make jokes about how it's a girl. Uh, it was it was actually kind of um, rewarding, and I feel like that like five chapters, I was like, oh, now I get programmers, because it was like, really, I always had this appreciation for people who could do something. Like I feel like I'm a facilitator, and I help people make their voices bigger and get them heard and accomplish what they want to accomplish. But um, when I look at you guys, I see people who like have an idea, have nothing, and create something which I'm not sure like exactly where it is that I draw the differentiators between what I do and what you do, but I, I kind of do. Like I feel like programmers are kind of like painters or contractors where they just throw things together and then you have this thing that totally <coughs> didn't exist before. Um, and to me that is amazing and fantastic. And so in those like first few chapters that I read, I like made this terminal window play 99 bottles of beer on the wall. And I was like, wow, I just, I just made something. Um, and I was quite pleased. And every time I like, I'm like, hmm, if I hit a pig and have millions, what am I going to do? I'm going to sit and I'm going to finish the Chris Pine book. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll learn like HTML, CSS. Wow. 
so I'm, I, one of the things that I always say when I describe myself is that I worship at the altar of the developer. Uh, I think you guys are awesome. I know not everybody here is a developer, but a lot of you are. And that's also why I'm nervous, because like, I feel like I just have super need to impress. Uh, but so I got here, and I started this giant list of notes about like all the things I wanted to talk about. Um, about like how to build developer communities and how to build communities and how to like balance things with licensing and with corporation versus open source and friendly versus professional. Um, and I have all these notes, which I think are kind of awesome. And then like in, two hours ago, I was like, okay, now I have all my notes. I have no idea how they all like fit together. Um, so I have like a giant document, and I'll probably pick up my iPad periodically when I go, okay, what comes next, and, and look at my thread. But um, I guess I'll talk a little bit about me first, which I also took notes on in case I got really nervous and forgot who I was and wanted to do. But um, I, I came, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Um, I grew up in a really religious uh, community, which I kind of feel like gives me a slightly different way of looking at things, just because I got out into the real world when I was 18 and I had to really like learn all these things that other people already knew and like basic things like what's this other gender called boy, and how do you talk to them? Um, I had like, cause I have four sisters, I have a brother now, but I didn't for most of my life, he's a lot younger than me. Um, and I went to an all girls school my whole life, and I didn't really have like a television that was accessible, and I didn't go to the movies or anything. I really like lived in my tiny little religious world. Um, and then I was like, I'm going to go to college. Uh, I don't know, my, my parents sort of got more religious as I got older, so like if you look at my siblings, they're totally like different people, nothing like me. But um, when I was a kid, I remember like what did we do when we had like an empty Saturday afternoon is we would sit around and like read the Reader's Digest, like the big words where you have to guess which of the four definitions is the right one. <laughs> uh, and for some reason I like look back on that as like something that made me intellectually curious and like doing that and playing Scrabble and playing like risk strategy games. Um, and so like from that from early then I was like, well, how do you learn all these big words? You go to college. Um, so I get to college and I get in the elevator like my first day and I have my book and this guy walks into the elevator and the door closes and I like back into the corner and I'm like, that's a dude. <laughs> should, I, should I talk to him? Should I say eh, what am I going to do now? And then he got up on the second floor and I was like, oh. um, <laughs> I like, I very vividly remember the first time that a guy asked me for my number in, uh, it was in like psychology classes, like towards the end of freshman, freshman first semester, and he was really nice, and he like sort of came from a similar background as me, so I shouldn't have found him like very intimidating, but he came over and he started a chat, and then he was like, can I have your number? And I looked at him like literally like completely clueless, and I said, what for? <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, uh, and then like five seconds later, someone like nudges me, and I'm like, oh, oh, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> Um, but I feel like I have, I, I kind of came into the world and had all these experiences that people had when they were um, younger and when they were children. And that made them more comfortable, but that for me made me a lot more analytical and made me think a lot about um, what makes people do the things they do and what kind of behaviors, I don't know, just like what, what makes people do what they do. And I think developers are, are more like that than regular people for sure. Uh, but for me, like I, I had adult, um, insights on things that you guys learned when you were seven to eight years old, which was interesting. It made me awkward for a little bit. Um, but I think it's also what makes me really like um, community building, because it's a lot about uh, taking a group of people and sort of kind of smushing them into being a person. Um, when you're really good at, uh, the, the people that I look to as really great community managers are people who say things like, the community hates this, the community likes this, the community is not going to like chocolate ice cream or whatever, right? And um, as you become more confident as a community manager in a big company, you say you get comfortable saying things like that, and you also get to a place where people believe you, and you say, like, you can't put that XYZ button on the website of your open source project. The community will revolt, or they will not like you, and you will lose these types of credibility. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's where I, I come from. What I do now, I work at a company called Strobe where I manage the marketing efforts, but I'm really hyper-focused on community marketing. Um, and I try to kind of have a good balance between having corporate marketing pieces and all the other things that you need to be a re reputable company, but also really paying mind to the fact that um, you only get one identity, and it's not, really, it's not really super true when 
people in big corporations try to say, like, okay, our community lives there, and here's everybody else, and those people don't really care what we do here, because they do, and they hear it. And when you put out a press release saying something outrageous or making you sound really big and really insert negative adjective here, they, they look at it, and they don't like it. Um, so it's a tough balance, and it's <coughs> kind of a struggle, because there's, like, a big magic book of marketing principles that you're supposed to follow in the sky, and people and executives try to kind of make you follow them, and it's sometimes hard to like say, like, hey, wait, you have to respect this invisible person who I'm telling you exists, who is called the community. Um, but so I worked there, previously I worked at a startup, not startup anymore, called uh, Engine Yard, also building developer communities. I run developer conferences, I do the annual uh, Ruby conference in San Francisco, and I do the jQuery conferences around the US, we do two every year. I started the first JRuby conference. I do various um, developer initiatives, like last year I ran the Ruby Summer of Code and the jQuery 1.4 program I helped start. Last year we had like this major marketing event release. Um, and I like doing kind of uh, fun projects like that, that, um, I don't know, I, I think marketing can be fun, and especially developer, um, developer marketing is kind of awesome. So I'm, that's my ramble about who I am. And let's talk a little bit about um, what I do. Uh, so when I got to college, um, it was kind of, I found college to be a really good microcosm of the real world. Um, I got really involved and I also at that time was kind of trying to find a way for myself to kind of get out of the place that I had grown up. I mean, it was awesome, but it, it really wasn't what I was looking for long term. I wanted to get out there and not live in this tiny little world. Um, and I got really involved. I had like three jobs in college. I did like the overachiever, I want to have my own apartment one day, earn tons of money thing. Tons of money being like three minimum wage jobs at the time, but <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, and I, I found the, uh, the college newspaper, which I got really, really involved in. Um, I incidentally met my husband there. That was kind of cool, I guess. Um, <laughs> but, it's on camera. Uh, so, but it was it was really awesome for me because it was like a a giant crash course in the real world, and we lived on the we went to this like really awesome commuter campus that it, it's just strange. Like I haven't really seen what they have there elsewhere, possibly because it's in like the heart of New York and everybody's like bigger than their britches and has an attitude. I don't know, um, but. There, there was like a hierarchy and people had jobs and roles and everybody took it really, um, really, really seriously. And when I joined the newspaper, like there were press conferences with the college president and there was a whole political structure and like it, it was basically a job. Um, and I learned a ton about running a company, I guess, there because I, I, I did run a company. When I eventually took over as the editor-in-chief, I had like a staff of 30 people and I had an annual budget every year. and. Um, accounting departments and all, all the kinds of stuff that you get there and you have to manage people and personalities and deadlines and all of that. Um, and it was kind of awesome. The part of it that wasn't awesome, by the way, is that you get out of college having like accomplished the things that you do if you're involved in campus activities and maybe having gotten to the top of the food chain and then you get out into the real world and you're back at the bottom again. Um, and you're like, I don't know, whatever it is you're doing, if you're writing crappy code or if you're getting somebody coffee and you're like, I just came from a place where people were serving me coffee, which is kind of what, which is kind of what makes people not want to leave college, I think. It makes people kind of stick around because you, it's like a fast forward little world that you can conquer it and then it's like, oh, but I have to go out and start again. So, hmm. But um, for me, it was also my first experience with something close to a meritocracy. Um, like I said, our campus was really kind of intense. We had these like 30 year old political parties um, where like alumni who were now like lawyers and po politicians would like come back and help um, these like little college students campaign and build their marketing <coughs> messages and like all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and there was this newspaper that I eventually ran and there was also a competing newspaper. So it was like a campus of like 15,000 people and there was this hardcore like journalistic competition going on. Um, and it was the first time where just on a large scale, you can really, for me, actively see, like, if you do a better job, you will win. Um, because it, it kind of seems at a lot of stages of growth that that's not the case, right? Because they might be shinier than you, or they might be louder than you. Um, and the, the merit in what you're doing might not win over, um, over that fluffy stuff. But um, for us, what, what to me constituted success at that time was that we had a really, um, we got the faculty. 
So, like, the other newspaper had lots of pages of, like, movie reviews and entertainment, and a lot of students read those and liked the comics, but when people really wanted to know what was going on with, like, the faculty union, and when people wanted to know what was going on with the college budget, and the, I don't know, like, like they got more audience when there was a shooting at the back of the campus all over New York. Um, it wasn't that exciting. Some, like, off-duty cop sat down in the subway and shot himself in the butt. <laughs> but, but, like, they had this giant, I don't remember what it was, but a headline that was like, cop shoot self in butt or something, right? And they, so they, like, had most readers that week. But um, when people really wanted to know what was going on with, like, important things, they, they turned to our paper. Um, and when the faculty wanted to know what was the kind of the pulse of the student body, they turned to our paper. And that was my first experience of, like, if you're just a little smarter and do a better job, you're going to, you're going to win. Um, and if you, if you kind of do this, if you build it, they will come. I, I kind of think that's true for a lot of things, but developer communities are a hyper example of it being not really true. You can't just build something. You have to build something that is worthwhile and good and having a quality. Uh, it's, again, it's like an audience where it's really hard to fool people. Um, and if you have all the shiny stuff but none of the meat, then you're not really going to, you're not going to get there. And that's part of what I think corporations don't get about community sometimes, is they think they just kind of throw a lot of um, big, shiny resources at things that they'll happen. But it's really more like, like I said earlier, about um, treating your community like a person and kind of learning what its personality is and what it what it likes. And um, you actually need to also be a person as a corporation, right? You need to be a citizen in that community, and you need to provide as much value as any other person who's trying to make it, or nobody really wants to hear what you want to say. Uh, so it's kind of different, like, if you're running a community for Coca-Cola, I guess, or a nonprofit, or anybody else who has, like, a, a really good reason to, to build community with their customers and get people interested in the same things, but you have to, I feel like, to a much stronger degree, actually make a contribution. And if you think about the corporations that you know in your various communities, um, I, I hope, if I'm correct, that the ones you're thinking about are the ones who either employ developers building your open source projects or who fund developers or who like do things that directly contribute content and value versus just having a forum or making noise. Um, and it kind of leads to a much better signal to noise ratio in general if you if your, if your corporations and your community kind of act like citizens. Um, it, it can go, I guess it can, meritocracies can go bad a little bit, like, and you'll see this sometimes, and I think this was sort of the case a little bit in the early Rails community where it can get a little bit too uh, competitive or a little bit too clicky, and like then it kind of backfires and people feel like they can't get in. But if it's a healthy community, it's one where everybody contributes and it's kind of relatively easy to get in just on on merit. And one of the important things that you want to focus on to kind of make sure that your community grows, and, and you need it to grow, right? Like if you're, let's say, a company or a community manager, um, you have finite ability to do things and affect things. There's just a limited number of hours in a day. And the way to kind of really make sure that you build something that then grows on its own and becomes self-sustaining is to be building evangelists within your community. And like when, when you find those people who are passionate about what you're doing and those people who are good communicators, talk, giving talks, doing screencasts, whatever it is, like those are the people that you really need to latch onto um, and really turn into your evangelists and your resources. And that's how you get from 100 developers, guys in their basements, to 5 million developers in serious technology that big corporations are hearing about at the top level. Um, and uh, evangelists will also help you do something that, um, so, so there's two things. First of all, you want to one of the ways that you can just like money helps in a community is kind of giving your evangelists the ability to help you, whether that means funding them going to conferences or even just like giving them t-shirts and swag and materials that they can give out. Um, it, it really does make a difference and it kind of um, helps them feel more invested in the success of the community. But the other thing that having these good evangelists to do is to help you take your community offline, which is um, something that not I, I've been to a lot of community talks, and not a lot of people talk about this because so much of what you do day to day is like um, building forums and resources and monitoring the IRC channel or whatever your choice community is. But um, it's really awesome and it's a really great way of creating more evangelists and getting people more invested when you get to them in a room and they kind of talk to each other about what they care about. Um, and they don't get the like blank stares that they get from their spouses or whatever when they like go off down some 
whole, I don't know, it, it, was, it was really fascinating for me the first few times that I, uh, that I went to a developer meetup, because um, I just, well first of all, I didn't know what anybody was talking about, but they all knew what each other were talking about, and that was kind of strange to me, because I was used to just watching, um, and, and also because like as somebody who's not a developer, I think if you're in a developer community, you might not realize this, but like the other things that people do in the world when they work at the Gap or when they work at a restaurant or when they're like, insert corporate title here in some other corporation, they don't love it nearly as much. And they don't like eat and breathe it like developers do. And they don't all, they do, right? It's your job, you do it most of the time. But it's it's very different. Like when they come home and at the dinner table they start like talking about their job, most of the time it's complaining. It's not like, I wrote this awesome line of code today and I'm gonna tell you about like why it, Increase the speed and how awesome it is. Um, but but bringing it offline kind of really helps foster that, and I think it makes people like like some a lot some of us have like spouses who are developers <coughs> and friends who are developers, and we get it's easy to, be, to forget that not everybody does. Some people are just like a guy with a wife and two kids and friends who do things completely different. And it's like an intoxicating, awesome experience when he gets to like sit in a room with other developers and just totally geek out. Uh, so, so yeah, the, the, uh, one of the things that I like to focus on about um, bringing your community offline, and this is one of the things that I mentioned earlier about kind of being a facilitator, is that having good logistics really, really does matter. Um, and I mean, you can do, like this is awesome, this is super casual and I'm really enjoying myself, but when you're going to, I shouldn't say but, I should say and, um, when you're like d doing this giant thing and things scale up, right, like I can't fit 600 people in this backyard. I need to think about like where are they gonna stand and like how many of them are gonna have to wait online at the bathrooms between breaks and like the walking around and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I really do pay a lot of attention to the logistics of any on-site and, and logistics kind of in general. I think that people, um, people who are passionate will oftentimes forget about the logistics because they just want to like get out there and talk about the stuff that they care about. Um, but if you do talk about it, and if you do think about it, it really like maximizes your success. And I run like a number of conferences, and like one of the things that I like to do when I run these conferences is go down to the venue beforehand and just like walk around, like follow the schedule and walk around. And you notice things that you just won't notice if you don't do that. Like that staircase doesn't actually fit people going up and down at the same time, even though that's the way I'm directing them. Mm, I need to like think about that. Or these chairs are really uncomfortable, or all the things like that, right? And like I should have signage over there, and stanchions, and, and those are the things that if people don't have to think about your logistics when they're on site, they'll not usually compliment you on it because they didn't notice, but that's like a huge chunk of what they're not complaining about. Because um, what they are complaining about when you don't think about it is how like the bathrooms were dirty, and they didn't, there was crowding at lunchtime, and they couldn't get to all their food, or at the user group there wasn't enough beer, and the beer was in the front, and people were talking in the back, and you couldn't get around. Um, so be, proximity to beer, yes, is obviously very important. Um, uh, so you want to you wanna do, one of the things I like to do at offline events, just to bring it back again, is, is uh, give out swag. I think it's really awesome when people can be proud about what they do, and it makes them feel a little bit more invested also. A lot of what I, what I think about when I think about what to do is how do I make people feel invested in what I'm doing? If you're just doing something and yeah, you want to think about getting people on board and like everything you do should be the beginning of a train and like get people walking with you. Otherwise, you're probably not doing um, that good of a job. Now, I, I talked earlier about like the dangers of community stuff, but there are things that we can learn. I'm sorry about corporate sponsorships and corporate corporations and corporate culture, but um, there are a lot of things that you should take from that, and a lot of things that um, sound sort of bad but aren't in community management. Like, I really feel like you, I've learned this a little bit over time, but you should have like a key message. You should have a platform, call it whatever you want. Um, you should have calls to action on your website, and you should think about stuff like that. Like, when they go to my open source project website, like, where is the download button? How easy are they going to find it? Um, and, what about the design of this website? How does that look? And does it really reinforce my message? And, and you want to be more sly about it, I guess. And you want to be more casual about it. And you don't want to get up there um, on whatever community site you have or resource or platform and, and kind of spout stuff that's clearly marketing drivel. But you do want to have that list in the back of your mind the whole time of like, 
these are the four things I'm trying to accomplish. These are the measurements that are attached to them, and these are the direct steps that I'm going to do to, to get there. And this is something that like I've has evolved for me because for me the, the the real thing you need is an instinct, right? A good sense of what people like, what they don't like, what they care about, how to keep them on your side. But once you sort of develop that, you can take it further and turn it into how do I measure what they like and how do I like directly affect it. Um, so presentation matters for sure. You don't want to be that like corporate salesperson. You don't want to have that feel of like there's a difference between um, being super sleazy polished and having your act really together. And like those are those are different. Like people a lot of times think if you have your act together, you have to have that like smooth sheen of perfection and that big toothy grin, but um, <laughs> not so much. Um, so messaging, like a lot of the, pro I'm involved, I'm on the, uh, the Jake Bray core team and we have this right, um, we have this right, left, do more tagline that is really like our main point that we hammer home. And if you pay attention to Rails, there's like the convention over configuration thing. And I kind of don't think that those open source developers necessarily sat in a room and said, what's our key message point? How are we converting? But, but they did it. They came up with this one point that they just hammer home over and over and over. And it really makes it easy for you to succeed at what you're doing because then it's just consistent. When two people get in a room and talk about what XYZ technology does and they don't agree, then it's, it's not really, um, it's not helpful. That's, that's one of the challenges of what I'm doing right now and why I'm so busy all the time is I'm trying to build this new community around this, this technology called Sprout Core. And it's been going really well so far, but we are still kind of figuring out what are, what's that one sentence that people think of when they think about our technology? And how do we make sure that everybody else can communicate about it um, and help us kind of promote our message? Um, also, the thing about corporations is that it, it's actually, it's kind of fun watching small technologies get into corporations. Um, and it also is really, for me, about evangelism. The way that um, the, the trajectory in Rails was just that you got to the guy in the basement, and, and the, the CEOs were like, why do we care about the guy in the basement? And I was like, yeah, you'll see, right? So we got to the three guys in the basement, and they got to their other 12 friends in their basements, and then they all went to work at Intuit and at t and all these giant companies that they worked at, and they said, hey, Mr. Big Boss, I really like this new small technology, and I've been playing with it. And the boss said, okay, well, you can start that small little micro project on it. And then it had merit, because hopefully what you're doing is awesome. And then that micro project was a million times better than the 20 guys doing Java down the hall. And he's like, duh. Um, and that's how we did it. Some, some, I see it laughing. And I'm like, I hope that's the I have persevered over a Java project as well laughter. Um, but it, it's kind of, it was awesome. Um, that also like brings my thoughts back to the metrics. When I first started in community management, one of the things that I would always tell um, my bosses was, I can do this and I can do this well and we can. there are lots of steps that we can follow, but I can't really guarantee that you're going to be able to measure it. Um, and this is gonna be a lot of front loading and building love and loyalty. And you'll see in a couple of years that, or a couple of months, whatever the timeline was for that project, that it, it really pays off. But you really should only start this if you have a little bit of faith. Um, and it, it was true then for me, because I was kind of new at it, and now that I've been doing it for a number of years, I know that you can measure community, but I still kind of start out with the same spiel, just because it really takes it really takes time to figure out what your community measure is. And it does it mean like people in my IRC channel? Does it mean on my mailing list? Does it mean downloads on Ruby Gems? What does it mean? Is it some like strange concoction of numbers that I put into an algorithm? My community number is now 2,000 because I've matched all those things up. I don't know, and, and you can do it, but it does, it, it, I don't know for your community, it, it changes drastically, but um, it takes a lot of time to figure out what it is and then to get all the tools built up to like actually measure it and then have enough data to make sure that you're actually correct and that when you pull certain levers, certain things will happen. Um, but but yeah, you can do it, and I think as, as people get better at it, it's gonna be easier to evangelize community <coughs> marketing as like a legitimate thing to do inside corporations, but I don't know, it's hard. I went to a community management, I went to like this meetup last week about measuring communities and I like walked out 30 minutes in. So I was like, ah, um, this is the same meetup I went to three years ago. So I think some people are thinking about it, but like it's not there yet. There's no like awesome canonical way to do these things. And if you go from one company to another to another, um, there are a lot of people doing
doing different things and a lot of people just failing altogether. Um, but it's hard to argue with the success of communities, at least specifically in developer marketing. And I, I know that like CEOs are coming around um, to those guys in the basement really matter and we need to make them love us, not just force marketing materials and sales people down their throats. Um, another kind of tangential point that I think about when I think about like corporations and the beginnings of your project is that um, licensing really does matter. Um, I'm not by any stretch a licensing expert, so please don't come up and ask and talk to me about it very much after. Um, but there is, there's one big key difference that I do know about and that I think really matters to your ability to foster a community, which is um, open source doesn't always mean open source. Um, what really matters is your contribution model. You can have, I've been talking a lot about this with, um, with Mr. Patchen about what the right terms are, and I think that the latest thing that we've settled on is like um, open source versus source available. Um, and when I think open source, to me that means like people can contribute and get involved and submit patches and get invested in my technology. And source available is more like you can look at the source, but there's not really much else that you can do. Um, and there are a lot of kind of big corporations right now trying to like muddle the lines a little bit and being like, oh, we're a big open source company, but you can't get involved in their communities if they even have communities. A lot of them don't. And I think some of them are kind of sitting around wondering like, hey, this open source thing was supposed to give me a community and they're supposed to be like millions of people around now in love with what I'm doing and if it didn't happen, I wonder why. Um, and I think that's uh, a big part of it is like, you actually have to give people the ability to get involved in what you're doing, um, and to get invested. Um, design matters is one of the things that I think about. Like open developers specifically are all about like release early, release often, and so they're a lot more tolerant of half-baked ideas and projects and websites and all that. But um, which is awesome. It leads to like getting those things done better so people can jump the cycle earlier and give you feedback that you can come up with on your own. But you should, on the like marketing side and community side of things, keep iterating and keep getting better. And like. Just because you're a, it's tough when you build like a, a site for a for an open source project or initiative. You kind of you don't want that corporate feel, right? But you also don't want that like I built this on GeoCities in my basement or something feel like I don't know, right? <laughs> um, you, you, what you you can do not corporate, but still do really, really well done. And I'm sure you can think of like one or two examples, I hope, of this happening, but you can probably also think of one or two examples of it not happening at all. And how some of the like really awesome projects that you use just have like this page with like a logo and a download button. Uh, and I think it does, it, it is absolutely a good use of time, and, and maybe not the developer time, but somebody else in your organization uh, to really focus on that. And that brings me to something that I learned from the jQuery community, uh, which from early on has really embraced the thought of that, the thought that not everybody on the core team of your development project should actually be a developer. Um, and at, at first it seems strange, but it, it really makes sense. Not everybody running the company at the bank is a banker, right? I mean, somebody's the marketing guy and somebody's the janitor and somebody's the like human <coughs> resources person. Um, and the jQuery project really took on that approach in their project, which I think is one of the reasons that we've been so successful, is from the early days, we had people on our core team who didn't write code. We had evangelists, we had um, event producers like myself, we had people who like built the backend tools but like weren't involved in the actual technology that we were promoting. And because we had that, we were able to kind of, act, we were able to actually succeed and not have rough edges in places where other people do, because if you're all developers, you're all good at developing, but you're maybe not good at all the other things that, um, that need to happen. I have no concept of what time it is. <laughs> okay, cool, well that's good, because I was quite nervous that I was gonna get up here and talk for 10 minutes and be done. Um, and then Evan was also telling me I shouldn't talk so fast, which I maybe did. Uh, we'll see, but, um, but yeah, those are just kind of, I don't know, those are some of my random, like, stream of thoughts about building developer communities. Um, it's awesome, it's rewarding. I love being surrounded by really smart people all the time, and it's not something I think I would be able to have if I was elsewhere. 
uh, and I think that everybody should really embrace building a solid and successful community around their project. So, do you have any advice or insight on helping people who uh, are like sort of executive level people from the older world of keeping customers as far away as possible and being insular and secretive in broadcasting to making them more able to understand more modern community concepts and open source because you're right, a lot of them are just totally doing it wrong and don't understand and are like, there's a community person and they sprinkle, you know, that community dust on the community and then suddenly we get free patches and we don't have to do anything or change anything we're doing. We can sue anybody we want to and blah, blah, blah. So, <laughs> my immediate answer is like, get a car with a really big trunk and an axe and just... <laughs> um, it's, it's really hard, is the thing. You, this is why it's kind of challenging to find the right community manager in the, or community, whatever role that they put in, in every organization is because um, you really, I guess I would say the kind of people who are really good at relating to other people and communicating and being nice and non-invasive are not always the kind of people who are really good at telling their CEO that he just doesn't know what he's talking about and needs to trust them. Um, and that's just something that is going to come with experience. Like, I think it's going to kind of fail a little for a couple of years. And then in a, in a couple of years, we'll have this, like, generation of community people who have grown up through this and who have developed the conviction and the experience to say, listen, you're wrong, and you hired me because I know how to do this, and you really need to trust me, or you're not going to get the benefits of my experience. And it will also, like, um, you'll also, we'll be building examples of where it was successful. Um, and it, yeah, I think Rails is a great example. I'm, I'm focusing less on Rails right now, but I feel really a sense of accomplishment for like what I kind of helped do with the Rails project, and I feel like it really makes it, I feel like that's something you can point to, right? Like the Skunk Works path that I was talking about, about guys in their basement and guys who like now have like Intuit running a giant like Ruby platform because they got beer at a meetup and that kind of stuff. Like we'll have more and more examples of that that we can point to and say like, here's all the places where what I'm doing really matters. Um, yeah, it, it, it's just going to take a little time, and it's hard, and you have to just repeat yourself over and over and not get demotivated and just, like, be strong about what you're saying. We have a few over here just to pass along, yes. Um, just to back up your point about, like, why it's important to have um, more than just developers on the core team, uh, I'm not a developer myself, so screw all you guys. Oh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, sometimes um, people get, um, people who know a certain thing so in and out have a really hard time viewing something that they've built from a perspective of someone that isn't sort of connected to it. And that goes both directions. You know, sometimes devs have a hard time appreciating some of the user interface experiences because since they know all the ins and outs, they don't see where there are glaring holes. Yeah. And also sometimes people on other sides of it don't understand enough the technology, they don't understand how hard it would be to do certain things or how easy, and then so there's kind of there. So having people of different specialties sort of gives different perspectives, which yeah. often is, is extremely valuable in those yeah. sorts of things. It doesn't work anywhere else. I don't know why like we would think it would. Uh, yeah, like I said, they're not all bankers. If they were, they would not be running a bank because it would fail. I'm up there, seriously. <laughs> all right, I have, uh, I have three questions, but you can oh, answer maybe. only one of them. Okay. Uh, so you can, it's kind of like a choose your own adventure. Um, so, okay, so my question kind of is, is grounded in like these, these companies that have their trademarks and they're like really holding on to these things and, and it disrupts the user community. Um, and so the first question is one, as a user community, how can we completely hijack the community away from someone like you? Um, the second question is, what would you do if we tried to do that and how would you keep us from doing that? Um, and the third question is like, how can we avoid that all of that to begin with? Sure. So you can kind of answer any of those questions. So, I sh if I'm the person that you want to take it away from, I'm doing a bad job. I'm I'm the person in the middle, and I kind of need to play both sides and keep the executives happy and keep the developers happy. But maybe this is just me and the re the way that I like to do things. But I'm on your side. Um, I understand what they want to accomplish, which is why I can kind of fit in the middle, and I get like we need to make money or have this number of X, Y, Z things happen. Um, but I don't know. I'm 
I believe in the developers and I believe in their ideals and what they're trying to accomplish. And so, so first of all, you're not trying to take it away from me. If you wanted to take it somewhere, I'd be coming with you and I'd be helping orchestrate it, um, as long as my boss is not watching anyway. No. Um, but that goes back to kind of the licensing thing that I was talking about earlier, which is if your project is properly licensed and your corporation goes awry, you up and leave and it doesn't matter that they're gone and there's nothing that they can do about it. And that kind of keeps them in a spot where they have to keep you happy. Um, and it, it happens often and it just happened with Oracle and you see it happen. And sometimes that means that they have to change the name of the project, but it doesn't even matter because if everybody comes along with you, all they have is nothing, they have a shell. Uh, and yeah, again, but that requires you having selected the right open source model and having they can own the trademark, they can own everything, it, it really doesn't matter. The code is open. You fork it, you start again, you're good. Uh, so, yeah, and, and the third por portion, I guess, which is like, how do you not have it go that way is the same answer to the first question, which is just it's really, really hard. There's no magical set of rules yet that I can point to, but um, developers kind of also should probably spend more time trying to understand what the motivations are for the CEO and like some of them feel sleazy and some you don't want to be like a slave to the corporate overlord and making money, but you also want a paycheck, right? Like he <laughs> does need to actually make money and you need to help him do that, even if it's not your top priority, even if you just kind of want to build something cool, right? So. You've talked about building an individual community. What about other communities that exist which might consider themselves somewhat competitive and then furthermore specifically what happens when one community is absorbed by another how do you sort of deal with that so uh, it could be a generic answer well i have a very specific experience so i don't know about a generic answer um i was kind of involved with the mer the mer rails mer merge back in the day um but so one of the, I, I, I can't remember if I like talked about this very much in my giant stream of consciousness, but one of the things that you want to try and do when you build your community is build an ecosystem, and similar to the way that you want to build evangelists among your people is that you want to build other companies to help you do what you're trying to do, um, and sometimes even do things that you thought you wanted to do, but again, you, you can't do it all. And Rails is an example of like a healthy time when that happened, and you have like those five companies doing screencasts, and those five companies doing training, those doing consulting and all everything you can think about that to me is super super healthy and that is what has allowed it to grow is that it wasn't like rails inc by dhh where he had to put a stamp of approval on everything right that would have completely hampered its ability to spread like it did um, so I just totally lost where i was going um, so competitively i think that if you're clever about it like you can um you should try and, if you're clever and you know exactly what your key differentiators are, ideally there's something a little bit different than your competitor and it's something where people kind of think you're the same, but you're not. You know they focus on X and we focus on Y. And with merging communities, one of the things that we did was make them play nice together. Um, and I'm working on Sproutcore now. People are like, how does Sproutcore compete with jQuery and which one should I go with? And the answer is go with both, right? Um, you, people, you, most projects have you can have a wide scope, I guess, but one thing that you're really, really focused on, um, and if you focus on that, you should be comfortable playing nicely with things that do things better than you, even if you sort of do them a little, and maybe even merging them in and doing things like having the side project, like Handlebars is now a huge part of, of the Sproutquery ecosystem, even though it's a separate project, and jQuery and all that. Um, I'm feeling shame standing next to me, so <laughs> I'm getting nervous, and I don't know if I've just made a lot of sense, but um, I hope so. It's tough. If you have something wrong, if your competitors are telling you you suck at something and you do, just fix it. Don't like defend it. Be like, my bad. We didn't do that right. We were focused on this and fix it. And 